Hi, I'm your host, Dan Cloutier, and I'm Director of Regenerative Farming with AgriHub. And today in our vlog, we're going to focus into a bit more specifics regarding biogas or renewable gas. What we end up uh, seeing is, is uh, there's quite a bit of uh, discussion and interest uh, in this space uh, in North America. In particular, it's new. Elsewhere, uh, particularly in Asia and Europe, it's uh, 20, 30 years uh, in. But anyway, uh, you know, as the Globe and Mail says, uh, a renewable biogas, natural gas uh, boom is is uh, underway and on the way. And then uh, all farmers are very aware of what's been happening of late with uh, fertilizer prices and, of course, um, the digestate that is a part of the process and a and a, and a great product that's available uh, from biogas production uh, enables um, uh, an ability to have these, these soil amendments and fertilizers uh, recovered um, from, from so-called waste streams. So uh, that is of great interest uh, these days. So this is something that... Um, uh, Agrihub has been working towards for a number of months now, and um, what we're uh, working with several parties on are, are projects that see Agrihub undertaking a general contracting uh, role in setting up uh, the biogas production facilities and doing so under typically a 15 or 20 year uh, operating uh, agreement. And we have uh, partners that uh, assist in enabling the farmer to uh, get to uh, put these facilities in place uh, with lo little to no uh, capital investment of their own, although um, sharing uh, in uh, proceeds and in and, and, and revenues and upside. So very uh, interesting opportunity. Um, you know what we end up seeing is is uh, more and more uh, utilities are uh, allowing um, and in providing a process to be able to uh, put um, biogas uh, directly into uh, current natural gas, uh, pipeline systems. And so uh, what Eggerhub will help with is these sorts of uh, agreements with uh, selecting the appropriate digester um, equipment, um, particularly as we'll talk about in a moment, smaller modular uh, systems is uh, a bias of ours. Um, to to address most of the marketplace. And then we end up with, um, uh, you know, soil amendments and, and distribution of said soil amendments. There's GHG trading in the mix and so forth. So th there's quite a lot to do. And uh, fortunately, uh, these are areas that um, um, we have personnel and partners that have been doing for a long time. Uh, I've been doing GHG trading agreements for, I don't know, probably 10 years, approximately something like that. So the reason I say smaller modular systems is so interesting is that right now there's a lot of uh, big companies, particularly the utilities, that are yet again pursuing uh, those that are left landfill uh, gas facilities and wastewater treatment plants. Um, because with the 10 large cities and then the smaller cities, et cetera, that is a very sizable amount of, of um, biogas and um, sought after. Um, it, it it suits the scale of of uh, utilities, uh, which mostly uh, tend to be large uh, companies, other than call it micro utilities. 
But that that is not a new space by any stretch of the imagination. Um, the 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 fact is is that um, I can point to uh, involvement with uh, some landfill gas stuff, um, particularly with the city of Calgary, which has got to be approaching at least twenty years. Um, you, you know the. Um, uh, main wastewater treatment plant in Calgary, for example, is on their second generation of of uh, cogen plant uh, uh, leveraging uh, biogas from the the wastewater plant. And so very, very mature things, um, great stuff to do. Um, but you know really the excitement and the push is is additional. Uh, uh, currently so-called waste streams. And, and as you see um, from this uh, study, agriculture is, is the big majority. It's 68% of, of the potential source. And um, uh, certainly there's uh, a handful of larger anaerobic digesters that have been around for a number of, of years. Um, we're currently involved in a, in a minor way with uh, uh, the Lethbridge uh, Grotech uh, plant. And, um, you know, that, that one's been operating 10, 15 years, something like that. But for the for the most part, um, a very significant majority of of uh, farms in in that agriculture uh, feedstock has not uh, been addressed. So um, there's a number of ways that uh, folks will potentially look to to do this, and um, um, one is uh, what would be referred to as, as hub and spoke uh, approach. So what we do is we get feedstock from many, 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 hopefully uh, uh, farms, and hopefully they're uh, as close as possible. And then it goes to one real large uh, digester, which is what um, the big uh, utilities and big players will prefer. But that is not without um, challenges and it's some challenges that come down to a certain degree to uh, individual uh, provincial uh, requirements. But um, of course, tracking uh, biosecurity on farms is a very, very important thing and a big deal. And um, there's different rules in, in, in different provinces to some degree. And if we were to uh, really completely uh, address that um, for all provinces, we would um, pretty much heat up uh, the waste to seven degrees C for 24 hours, thereby um, killing the, the pathogens. Uh, but by doing so, we would also be um, suffering a huge loss of the amount of methane production available um, from these feedstocks. You really want these uh, feedstocks as fresh as possible. So that just highlights the first issue of many uh, issues, challenges in coordination, limiting the amount of economic cost, trucking uh, these feedstocks, particularly when they're um, heavily laden with water, which is a good thing. Um, for, for methane production and, and water recapture, not a good thing for transportation cost, of course. And so as we would have lots of spokes, there's lots of contracting considerations and logistics and so forth. Um, and unfortunately, um, uh, smaller farmers um, that are, you know, you know your, your typical call it, 800 or a thousand head dairy operation they don't need digesters they can't use digesters that would be really the 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 large uh industrial scale so um essentially how it ends up working and this is one of the uh coordination 
uh, factors is that um, livestock waste, as we've seen, is a great source of feedstock for, for a digester. We really don't want to um, be growing crops um, and using uh, food grade agricultural lands to send to a digester, um, then, then that's when it's not referred to as renewable uh, gas per se. Um, sewage uh, wastewater streams are fantastic um, and to a degree that can come from uh, many types of, of livestock uh, barns and so forth. Um, and, and then when you have um, not enough uh, diversity, if you will, in the, in the feedstock, um, uh, just too much manure and only hay, et cetera, it's, it's challenging um, to, to run these digesters in an optimum way. And so, you know, the, the diversity of feedstock that comes from food waste is really uh, coveted. Um, and even more coveted is oils and greases and tallows. Um, and, you know, some of this can be uh, coordinated on a small scale, uh, even better than trying to do large scale um, uh, hubs. Um, in, in Europe, um, for the most part, uh, what they do with the biogas is they run it into cogeneration plants because we get the highest uh, mechanical efficiency from that. Um, so we're ending up generating uh, electricity for the grid at the same time as we're uh, producing heat from the biogas. And if it's located somewhere where the heat is needed, then, then we just end up with really uh, high, high uh, levels of, of efficiency. And because the efficiency is at the highest levels, it's, it's the best economics. Canadian current uh, utility scheme is not favoring this, but instead saying take the biogas and and put it um, directly into uh, the pipeline system, and and they're offering a, uh, you know some very uh, good uh, dollars for that uh, gas. So so that's uh, what's driving the economics today, and it will it will drive the market until uh, that changes. Obviously, always cautious to get involved with. Uh, government programs um, that are susceptible um, to to the ways the wind is blowing. Uh, the nice thing with the current offtake agreements is is they're with utilities and and they're long term. Um, so so it, it it mitigates a lot of that um, flavor of of the month or flavor of the election uh, cycle. In addition to the biogas, of course, there's real value coming from the digestate, which includes fertilizer and soil amendments and livestock uh, bedding. And when we're doing the right things with these plants, we're actually um, uh, harvesting out these uh, uh, great uh, products at the same time as as we're returning the water to potable conditions. And so um, this is a really great tool for for getting to uh, renewable. And um, uh, so as I say, um, a lot of big companies want big central uh, systems. And um, this is the kind of, of uh, system that would be in place. And, and when I'm, uh, you know, I've got uh, in this instance, uh, multiple trucks in, in theory are arriving. And so um, we're running this into to our uh, digester. Um, we've got a centrifuge, so we've got a wastewater uh, plant here, and and then we've got um, um, gas going to the to the uh, pipelines, and and we have um, uh, 
our our biofilter and organic uh, matters uh, being harvested, as we've discussed. Big plant, small plant, no difference to speak of on that. Um, just just the amount of equipment and and so forth. So we have, as AgriHub, have fostered some relations with a, a very unique European and Canadian uh, operation that has focused on doing smaller scale uh, facilities than, than uh, uh, most. There's very few that focus on that. So um, on a lot of this kind of a large scale plant. If you come and you say, "Well, I got a 800 head uh, dairy operation. Uh, can we do this?" No, because our plant's too large. It needs more feedstock. You got to go hub and spoke uh, to make that happen. But um, we can do tank based smaller systems that um, uh, mean that that we're um, uh, able to address that 800 head. Uh, dairy operation, as an example, or or you know, um, two thousand head or three thousand head hog operation, etc. And um, we're pushing the ball um, in in uh, looking at um, the ability, you know, lagoon based anaerobic digester systems are are um, just as old as as these tank uh, based uh, systems. The only difference is is that purely lagoon based tends to be only in warm climates so that they can use they can operate year round. Emerging more is that in cooler climates, um, you know uh, parts of of uh, the US, um, in particular, um, well, gee, they they might only operate four thousand of the eight thousand seven hundred sixty hours in a year. Um, but those those economics can work because the lagoon based system is so much less capital cost than this kind of thing. Well, as you've seen in our building um, energy efficiency uh, series. There's a bunch of tools that we can put in place where we have translucent uh, greenhouses and so forth um, that allows us to also, uh, in cold climates, operate uh, these lagoons uh, year round. In in some ways, um, my view is we treat some of this like Oh, it's so cutting edge! Oh my goodness, you need so much technology, and holy gee, you know the the safety issues are just whoa. Got to engineer this, you know. And the fact is, as as um, this slide attests to, is uh, making methanes is not something humans invented. It happens as a natural process, full stop. So that goes back a ways in, in history. Capturing methanes for human use is um, a, a little trickier, but as we uh, see, um, there is, is sources that tell us that the uh, Persians, um, have have been capturing gas and used it for uh, heating uh, their communal bath um, houses uh, back into ancient uh, times, and then we see some specific uh, records, you know, as as far as uh, who who did more of this kind of stuff in in medieval times, and so this is is. Um, a building that still exists and was a bathhouse and included in it uh, that methane uh, capture for, for heating uh, water. In this uh, example in, in Oregon, it's really interesting to see an equally very simple solution. Granted, uh, Oregon is a nice mild climate, so the heating aspect is, 
to keep this operating is non-existent. But what they're able to do with this little system is they take um, five pounds of, of community uh, kitchen scraps and garden waste um, and, and turn that into a day's worth of cooking fuel uh, for this particular uh, community kitchen. Uh, the way they're doing it, uh, as they say, is, you know, they, they constantly have to monitor and feed uh, this system. And so there is fine aspects of the technology that take a bunch of that uh, labor and perhaps lack of know-how um, and, and uh, dramatically diminish it in the equation. So, so even though I'm pointing out that these systems need not be so complicated as some want to make them, um, th there's, there's a, a balance there that's uh, essential and, and uh, comes into the mix. So um, on a lagoon-based system, they're uh, very often, you know, these, these uh, two-stage uh, systems. And all we're uh, looking to show here is, is uh, the opportunity to house this lagoon in a greenhouse, um, leverage the, the uh, passive solar heat gain of a translucent membrane, uh, keep that heat in the building because it's airtight. And so now we have uh, really great odor control, which is so desired uh, by farmers in the community and getting along. Um, that, that by itself is a huge advantage. In that airtight facility, just the natural heat uh, produced by these uh, anaerobic lag lagoons help keep this structure uh, warm. And um, so we end up with a really dramatically reduced um, uh, capital cost to to uh, building the facility. And so that's that's a very uh, interesting uh, opportunity. And in really cold climates, um, very often people will say, well, and rightly so, well, that's nice, but, you know, we're not going to be able to operate all year because December, January, February, something like that, it's, it's just going to overcome uh, that system. And um, so what else do we do? Well, by, by showing this kind of approach where we've added um, concentrated solar into the mix. So basically we're going to, we're going to, to heat with, hot water and we're going to do so uh below the ground and and so just as there's been greenhouses that have been proven to be able to do this in cold climates and the manitoba hydro building which we highlighted um we can show that um we can grow uh citrus uh, throughout uh the, the winter in in pretty cold places because of these things and um given that it's a lagoon and water is 800 times the density of air when we put this into the mix we can engineer these sorts of things so that we have a system um that will will uh, operate uh year round um with little energy input uh, for for that heating, so um, that is is uh, very much uh, part of our our vision. Um, this slide um, is is uh, showing from about I'm going to say eight nine years ago. Um, you know, Japan imports all of their. Uh, natural gas and uh, via LNG, and they have since the 1970s. Um, so, uh, what Yanmar was was uh, doing from way back, and and doing at small scales that that mostly um, Europeans, North Americans haven't uh, tackled. But you know, they're they're literally taking the waste from a hotel and a, a I'm sure it's a large hotel, um, but supermarkets and they're and they're running cogens using just the biogas from 
from these waste streams and these uh, facilities. And they're generating uh, 25 kilowatts of electricity and simultaneously um, something around 37, 40 kilowatts of, of thermal energy. And they're doing that on, on uh, small farms. And so it, it proves we don't need to re-engineer the wheel. These types of systems at all kinds of scales, technically absolutely available. And then what are the economics? Should we do this smallest scale currently in in um, in Canada? I don't think you'd find the economics would would pencil out, but um, some of these other uh, systems uh, do. So, you know, um, some poultry operations, just using this as an example, have been able to sell their manures. Not not all the agriculture uh, feedstocks are are being sold. They're, they're still treated as waste. Some guys are paying tipping fees, etc. Um, but anyway, because of the fertilizer costs, this gets more valuable by the day. And so by some estimates, uh, poultry manures currently have a 50 to $60 uh, per ton value. And so some people are pelletizing this stuff up and, and capturing that value. Great, but um, the fact is, is a tremendous amount of value is being left on the table if you're not first capturing the biogas and then uh, uh, generating revenues from the digestates and, and soil amendments slash fertilizers. So what we end up <laughs> seeing in, when we think of, of integrated uh, we build farms is that we can imagine these uh, fodder systems as, as uh, we talked about in an earlier segment, that uh, really provides a premium uh, feed at lower cost um, uh, to, to our operations. And then we're capturing uh, the manures. And if we're not putting it in the pipeline, perhaps we're doing like uh, Yanmar has been doing for so long and, and running it through, uh, through cogen plants. Um, but, but um, uh, still, still getting, uh, the the soil amendments uh, in the equation. Thanks for your attention. And we look forward to uh, sharing our next um, vlog with you. Uh, we always are keen to collaborate uh, with our viewers. Uh, please do not hesitate to send an email with comments or questions uh, to me at this email address.